India. In the searing tropical heat, hundreds of thousands of pilgrims gather to worship God. They're not Hindus, as you might expect, but Christians. And this convention is the largest gathering of Christians anywhere in the world. Their deep faith is the legacy of the apostle most remembered for his lack of it, Thomas. The name Doubting Thomas has become a byword for disbelief and scepticism. Yet the truth about the Apostle Thomas may be much more complex. From the very start, he alone declared a willingness to die with Jesus, and a recently discovered gospel claims Thomas was chosen to receive the secret sayings of Jesus. By evangelizing India and possibly China, it may have been Doubting Thomas who took the message of Christ further than any other apostle. It was an odyssey that spanned four decades and would push him to the limits of his faith and physical endurance. Adventurous, unwavering and bold, this is not the Thomas most people would recognize. To really understand him, we must travel back to the hills of Judea, where the story of Christianity and Thomas began. Jesus had summoned a group of followers to accompany him as he preached. One of them was Thomas. At first, he remains in the shadows. We really know nothing of the background of Thomas. I mean, some of the others are, right, at least four of them are identified as fishermen, but about Thomas, we don't. Were he a fisherman, I suspect it might have been mentioned, but he could have been a farmer, he could have been a carpenter like Jesus himself, any of the sort of lower middle class trades in Galilee. When Jesus is put at risk, Thomas finally emerges. He's blunt, confident, and leading from the front. The Jewish authorities threatened to kill Jesus if he dared to visit his dying friend Lazarus. Thomas has no doubt about making the ultimate sacrifice alongside his master. He says to the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So who is this man who shows such loyalty and commitment? Even his name poses a fascinating problem of identity. Thomas means twin. And for the early Christians, this posed a tantalizing question. Whose twin was he? Could he have been the twin of Peter, of Andrew? Could he even have been the twin brother of Jesus? Was he literally the genealogical twin? I would doubt it very much, because the only place we find it mentioned is where they are insisting that if you want to see Jesus, look at Thomas, where he is the sort of twin with quotation marks. I would say the perfect manifestation, the ideal example, the other Jesus, as it were. Whether joined by blood or not, Thomas enjoyed a close relationship with Jesus, even if at times he failed to comprehend the true meaning of his words. At the Last Supper, Jesus talks enigmatically about where he's going. The disciples are confused. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Is this where the doubt sets in? When Jesus is arrested later that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, Thomas, like the others, abandons him to his fate. The man who had promised to die alongside Jesus, in the end, chose not to. When Jesus rises from the tomb and first appears to the disciples, Thomas is not among them. When he's told, he refuses to believe. Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And so Thomas then became 
almost a hero of doubt, that one of the apostles doubted, so it was all right for us to almost. And that's a little bizarre because to doubt is not actually to sin. In, in Christian thinking, um, having serious doubts about something is not a kind of a major failing. It's a way of saying, I'm a human being and I'm putting one step in front of another and trying to get there. What is Thomas doubting? He is doubting the belief of the disciples. And he's saying, I want to believe that, but I must have the same experience you have had. So rather than being doubting Thomas, he's authenticating Thomas. Thomas finally sees the truth of the resurrected Jesus. He finally understands that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He confesses, my Lord and my God. Doubt becomes certainty. And this drama of doubting Thomas would inspire artists throughout the centuries. It, it's fascinating to see the way in which artists, and this goes back to the um, uh, ancient Orthodox iconography, I mean, it's not just medieval and Renaissance artists, it's much earlier, they have this thing about Thomas actually touching the wounds of Jesus because, of course, in John's Gospel, we're not told he did, which is curious that the artists from very early on filled in the gap and made Thomas reach out his finger. And it's a very dramatic moment. In this graphic portrait by Caravaggio, Thomas pokes his finger deep into the fleshy wound, probing for truth. It's as if the condition of Thomas is the condition of us all. With other apostles, Thomas meets the risen Jesus for the last time on the shores of Lake Galilee. In a final miracle, Jesus fills their nets with fish. They're now to become fishers of men. In the last uh, chapter of John's Gospel, uh, Jesus appears to a group, and uh, the place of Thomas in that group is a little unusual. He's named immediately after Peter. And so I think it is rehabilitation of Thomas in, when he appears then in a, a slightly more prominent role at the very beginning of chapter 21. In spite of his rehabilitation, Thomas doesn't play a leading role alongside Peter in the early movement based in Jerusalem. He simply vanishes. But his story is far from over. 2,000 years later, his name resurfaces from the sands of the Egyptian desert. For in 1945, a concealed jar was discovered containing a manuscript that would generate unprecedented excitement. It was a gospel bearing the name of Thomas. These are the secret words that the living Jesus spoke. You should be wise as serpents and innocent as dust. Split the wood, and I am there. Love your brother like your soul. In style, it is the sayings of Jesus. There's no actions. There's no birth story. There's no miracle stories. There's no passion story, no resurrection story. It's, it's sort of the sayings of Chairman Jesus, as you could always say. The sayings in Thomas are different from those found in the four Gospels. If they are as old, then they offer a radical new picture of Jesus. So the Gospel of Thomas is very different from the Gospels of the New Testament. It suggests that Jesus comes from the divine light and manifests the image of God. So do you, and that's what you need to learn from the Gospel of Thomas. That's totally different from something like the Gospel of John, which says Jesus came from the light, is the light of the world, and you and I and all of us are in complete darkness apart from him. I am the light that is above everything. Become wanderers. By having a gospel named after him, it suggests that Thomas appealed to certain communities in early Christianity and influenced subsequent writings. In the library of the ancient monastery of St. Catherine's in the Sinai Desert, there's a manuscript that proved popular with third century readers who devoured its story of an exotic missionary adventure. It's the Acts of Thomas. At 
that time, we, the apostles, were all in Jerusalem, and we portioned out the regions of the world in order that each one of us might go into the region that fell to him and to the nation to which the Lord sent him. By lot then, India fell to Thomas. He did not wish to go, saying that he was not able to go on account of the weakness of his flesh and how can I, being a Hebrew man, go among the Indians to proclaim the truth? The Acts of Thomas is an oriental romance, but it may be based on truth. That Thomas turned his back on missionary activity in the West and instead carried the message of Christ to the East. Southern India is home to a vibrant Hindu culture with some of the finest and oldest temples in the country. It's also home to a large and confident Christian community. They don't owe their existence to Portuguese missionaries or the British Raj. Their roots are not found in Lisbon or Canterbury. They consider Thomas to be their founder. They consider he came here 20 years after the death of Christ. But if the other apostles traveled within the borders of the Roman Empire, preaching in its major cities of Corinth, Alexandria, and Rome, why would Thomas choose to go east? I think it's a very Eurocentric attitude that all roads led to Rome. Some roads led to Rome, clearly, and, and uh, Judea and Palestine was part of the Roman Empire. But a lot of the economy of Palestine looked eastwards. So, so St. Thomas wasn't a sort of, you know, emissary of civilization going to outer black India. He was someone from the provinces going to a much richer civilization. According to legend, Thomas sailed to the Malabar coast, to the region now known as Kerala. The exotic world that hugged the shores of the Indian Ocean would have been a revelation to someone from the deserts of Judea. Its rainforests were home to extraordinary wildlife. Its land produced unusual fruits and spices. Indeed, Thomas would have traveled the spice route to India that was exploited by the Roman merchants. You needed a large ship to do it because it was a, it was a turbulent journey, making use of the, uh, of the uh, monsoon winds, which obviously were, were, were high buffeting winds. You couldn't do it in a tiny dinghy. Uh, you needed a proper large trading vessel. Uh, and you also needed to be able to make the act of faith. You had to leap out into the open ocean. The place where Thomas first landed is today known as Kodongula, and it's the site of a major shrine commemorating him. But once there, would his new message of salvation be accepted by the local Hindu population? Uh, India was not such a, a hostile place to foreigners. We have been a very hospitable place, and um, religious traditions like uh, Buddhism and Jainism had flourished here. So Thomas came to a place which was already uh, ripe and sensitive uh, with spiritual uh, ideas. Fundamental to Christ's teaching was that God's kingdom was open to all. India would present a unique problem for Thomas's mission with its rigid caste system dominated by Brahmin priests. It's quite possible that Thomas took the view, as did the later Portuguese, that if you were going to convert India, you should start at the top of the caste pyramid and convert the Brahmins and then work downwards. Because if you started with a, with a lower caste church, India being as rigidly hierarchical as it's always been socially, that you weren't going to get the upper caste converting at all. Uh, if you started with, with the sudras, with, with the untouchables. One day, approaching the town of Palayur, Thomas encountered by a pool Brahmins believing that by sheer will of faith they could stop water in the air. These white men, a beautiful person, they allowed the, him to go to the pool. So he prayed. And he took the water and he threw all these things in the air. 
great to the great surprise of all the people each drops remaining in the air and glittering in the sun then they could realize oh 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 Thomas journeyed along the labyrinth of backwaters that linked village to village. He established seven communities, each with its own church. Together, they would form the cornerstone of Christianity in India. Just as the trade route brought Thomas to India, so the same route may have taken him further east, to China. Well, I think um, the circumstances probably helped him because there was this famous Silk Route to China and there was a Sea Route again to China and the uh, Northeastern Asia. So it was rather easy for a person like Thomas to travel with the uh, traders, with the merchants to this uh, far, so-called far-off lands. If it's true that Thomas brought Christianity to China, and became the Apostle of the Orient, he would have been responsible for taking the word of God further than any other Apostle. His final journey took him to the hills of Southeast India. He'd settled in the town of Malapur and was now too old for further travels. But he continued to preach and convert, and in doing so, he created enemies. One day they found Thomas praying in a cave near his home. He was dragged outside and stabbed with a spear. According to Marco Polo, Thomas, echoing the words of Jesus on the cross, prayed, Lord, I thank thee for all thy mercies. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thomas was martyred in AD 72, 20 years after he first stepped ashore in India and the place of his martyrdom has become a center of worship and pilgrimage. According to tradition, his body was removed and taken to the west, emerging on the Greek island of Patmos. In the monastery of St. John's, they proudly display their most treasured possession. It is, they believe, the skull of Thomas. Although his bones may be in the West, for Thomas' Christians, his heart still beats in India. In Kerala, you can see the legacy of Thomas everywhere. Lively Christian communities, a unique architectural heritage, and over six million adherents. The words and deeds of Thomas continue to pass down from generation to generation in the same way they always have done, through stories and songs. Thomas himself told the story of Jesus as a first-hand witness. He didn't walk around with the New Testament in his hand, the Gospels had yet to be written. Christians call Kerala God's own country. Although Christianity is not a major religion in India, its churches are thriving, its services are packed. The Church of Thomas accepts all castes from gold merchants to Dalits, the untouchables. Its confidence may stem from its own, perhaps unique, view of its founder. The Western attitude has always been of Thomas the doubter, uh, of Thomas as the man who questioned the risen Christ, who, who wanted evidence before he believed it. In India, there's a very different attitude to him. They emphasized the fact that he was the first person to explicitly state Christ's divinity. 
he said, my Lord, my God. So I don't agree with those people. Any person is going to say that Thandos is doubting Jesus Christ. No. No. He was the person who promised, you encourage the apostles, let us go and die with him in Jerusalem. The vibrancy of this church is evident with its annual gathering involving over a million pilgrims to honor Thomas and the church he founded. And when the convention is over, they'll return to their homes in all corners of India and in all corners of the world. In a church once attended by Shakespeare and designed by Christopher Wren, Thomas Christians in London gather to celebrate the Eucharist, the reenactment of the Last Supper. We've forgotten that Christianity was originally an Eastern faith, every bit as Eastern as, as Judaism, as Islam, and, and indeed Hinduism and Buddhism. It's an Eastern faith that travelled West. And St. Thomas, as the possible twin of Jesus, as certainly one of the Twelve Apostles, was the Apostle who went East. And I think he's the vital symbol of this, the other half of Christianity, who we've completely forgotten about in the West. For most people, Thomas is the disciple who dampened the joy of the resurrection. But he overcame his confusion and uncertainty to become an apostle with courage and conviction. These Thomas Christians demonstrate the true legacy of doubting Thomas. Next week we return west to tell the story of two friends who became apostles, Philip and Bartholomew. <laughs>